you've actually written with your spouse. Yeah. Which, uh, what was that experience like? It was mostly fun, actually. There, really? were, there were a couple of tense moments in there. But mostly, I mean, we were talking about that last night because I knew I'd be coming to do this interview. Uh, mostly we, um, we do respect each other a lot, and mostly we just set aside our differences and we would say, well, we'll solve that problem later when we could. We also broke the work down in a way that I think suited both of us. Yeah, you have strengths is, that you feel like right. you each brought to. And it was also that we would, it had to happen within a certain time frame because what happened with that project is we had read the book aloud to our children. We both wanted to adapt it. Okay. We um, decided that we would do it together if we could, if we could get the rights. And initially, the estate of Roald Dahl would not let us have the rights. We met with um, Lissy Dahl, his widow. She said he had never been terribly happy with films made from his books, and that we said, well, the way that we could get around that was we would give her absolute script approval, that she would let us have the rights for a period of time, and we, in turn, would not sell the screenplay without her approval. Okay. And so we were assuming all the risk. The only thing that she had to do was not sell the rights to someone else. Right. And so we had, I guess, kind of a pocket option in that sense. And she liked the screenplay. We went out together and sold it. Um, that process of you can have it for a certain period of time and then you'll sell it meant that the film had to be written in a certain chunk of time and my husband was editing his film Dream Lover okay. at exactly that same time. Wow, that's intense. And so for us to begin work it meant that I had to break the book down. I had to do the outlining and then I had to sit with him and go through it scene by scene by scene and describe the movie that I was imagining always coming back to the book as a kind of touchstone. So some of the dramatic narrative problems um, I had already kind of solved and then it was just like, here, honey, see what you can do with that. Okay. And so he wrote a very quick first draft. And then I spent about three months refining that draft. Okay. And then we passed it back and forth for a couple of weeks until we had something that we called the draft. And that was what we gave to Lissy Dahl. Okay, so it wasn't so much that someone was stronger on dialogue and someone was stronger on structure. It was more like because no, of the it, circumstances. It had to you do were... with, with the circumstances, yeah. Uh, do you do you guys read each other's stuff before you, you go out with it? I mean, do you, do you? Yeah, we do look to each other, but not necessarily before we go out. One of the things that's evolved in the 23 years that we've been married is that we will sort of save each other for a really important read. Oh, okay. You I know, see what you're when you are right. receiving notes and you go, "Am I crazy? These don't <laughs> seem like notes that are going to make this better." Then we'll give it to the other to say, what do you think? And we're sort of like, you know, the reader of last resort. Okay. Do you give it to, do you, do you show your work to other people or, or like bounce things off other people on ones that you're writing that you, on, on your own? I usually have um, a relationship with a producer or an executive and make them my creative partner. And um, very occasionally, I will go outside of that to um, a friend, um, usually someone who has a kind of vested interest. Like I've work, been working a lot for the last two years on pieces that have to do with Jane Austen. And so I've given it to a friend of mine who used to be an English professor. So, but it, usually I'm, I'm sort of alone except with the people that I have decided to partner so with. So it's sort of like a one targeted collaborator in that sense producer or an executive? Or... Yeah, because that, that person who's going to help you get your movie made is your most important creative ally. Um, which writers do you admire, both screenwriters and, and authors in other media? Oh, that's such a tough question for me because it's an ever-moving answer. Are there sort of milestones of things that you've read that you think, wow, this, this is a really inspiring script or this is this person really... Right. Well, there were, there were screenwriters that I um, really was influenced by, I guess, when I first started, who, were, they, who wrote movies that I loved, that I grew up with loving. Um, and Billy Wilder and I.A.L. Diamond, you know, okay. were definitely a writing team that I was aware of and, and liked. And Ben Hecht and um, Joe Mankiewicz. And then when I, when I looked around among my peers, I realized that there were so many wonderful writers to choose from, you know, uh, that it's almost impossible. 
But I do sort of make a point when I know that there's a new script by Eric Roth or Steve Zalian or Callie Khoury, people like that, I, I, will, I will hope for a chance to be able to read their screenplays because I think they're wonderful writers. But what does that do for you? Do you, do you feel like it, 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 it's just inspiring generally? Or it's what inspiring you... generally, I would say. I'll tell you what I find to be really valuable is every now and then there'll be a panel where I'll get to go and sit with other writers and talk about craft. And okay. the, the Austin Film Festival does this every year in October, and we go about every other year, my husband and I. And I love that because to hear other people talk about craft, I find to be instructive. I remember hearing Guillermo del Toro um, speak on horror and suspense, and I just felt doors opening in my mind because it was not a genre that I had paid much attention to other than enjoying them, but I hadn't thought a lot about you know, the craft of that. Right. And I, I, I avail myself of those opportunities. Do you ever draw uh, concretely from your own life for your screenplays? I think that it is impossible to be a writer and not draw from your own life. Well, but I mean, do Even you ever actively look for, look for inspiration in your, in your immediate space or your immediate relationships? I don't write as yet, anyway. I don't write that autobiographically, except that I see shadows all the time in my work. Hmm things from my life. Right, that's an interesting way to put it. Can you give an example of anything maybe indirectly that, that was generated from your, from your personal experience that ended up in one of your screenplays? Well, I, since we've spent time talking about Little Women, I'll say that I felt as a child very much identified with Jo March. And um, she was sort of a beacon for me since I didn't know any really living writers that there was a girl in a book that wanted to be a writer and I was a girl that wanted to be a writer. I felt kind of wedded to her. And I was unsurprised, I, I should have been more aware of this ahead, but it was very unsurprising when I was doing publicity on Little Women to meet female journalists upon female journalists saying, I hope you did a good job with this because I am Jo. Hmm. You know, so wow. <laughs> it was, I, I think that that was a, something that, um, was, is true for a lot of girls, that they'll find a character in a book to identify with, and I think all of these writers did right. in Joe March. But in terms of just, um, I see certain characters, um, shadows of certain characters um, from script to script. Um, I'm interested in ambition, certainly. I see that, that strain running through, like the rivals. I did a thing on Eleanor Dusa and Sarah Bernhardt, oh, a right. script that I sold. And that thing of Eleanor Dusa being, you know, the, the newcomer, the one that no one expected much of because she was from Podunk, Little Italy, and theater was really happening in Paris and London. And, you know, I sort of, I found echoes of my small town childhood in her desire to leave there and sort of take on the world. So I do think that there, that, that's one of the things that we can't escape is that we end up telling our own story behind the mask of whatever story we take on. Well, speaking of telling stories, we have a little screenwriting exercise for you, an inspiration exercise. Oh, okay. We call it the object, don't worry. <laughs> it's a very pleasurable experience. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm going to call Frederick to... Uh, if it's not pleasurable, can I stop it? <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Uh, the way this works is we call it the object. When I ask Frederick to, he'll pull the dome on the tray there and there'll be an object that we've chosen. And what you, we'd like you to do is to, wherever it takes you, whatever character, story, whatever comes out of it for you, tell us about that. And then after that, we'll talk about maybe where your ideas came from. Okay. Make sense? Yes. Okay. Frederick, please. Your object, my lady. You can take it and touch it and... Thank you, Frederick. Wow, oh, this is a this is a photograph of a man in uniform, and it says to Aunt May with love, L. Ray. So a couple of things come to mind for me. One is the thing I'm working on right now, which is an adaptation of the Jane Austen Book Club by Karen Joy Fowler, which is an ensemble piece. And in it, there's a girl named Prudy who's been raised by a kind of neglectful mother. 
with an image just like this in her life of the father she never knew. And because her mother makes up so much that isn't true, she doesn't know whether this picture of this father that she looks at and worships is a real guy or whether it's just something that she bought at a junk store. Oh, interesting. You know? So that's, this speaks to me very directly from what I'm working on. But I'm looking at L. Ray, and I'm reminded of something that I'd like to write sometime about my brother, who at the age of 19, very frustrated living in Northwest Florida, not knowing what direction his life would take, kind of getting stoned every now and then on his surfboard to just kind of pass the time, decided that what he needed in his life was discipline and travel, and he joined the Navy. And he was such a dreamy, interesting, creative boy that to put himself into that situation, I thought, was one of the more interesting things he could have done. It was an unexpected choice. It was unexpected, and I made up an alter ego for him. Oh, wow. That we called Roy. <laughs> and he ended up being stationed on the USS Ranger out of San Diego, and he would come up to Santa Monica and have his, like, you know, white wall haircut and his uniform and so forth. And at that time, I was doing a lot of photography with Polaroids and making movies on Polaroids so that there would be these narratives. And I created a lot of short narratives about Roy oh, wow. and his life. <laughs> and we would just go around and I would photograph him in these different situations and we would write captions for this oh, so and kind of tell a story. I mean, he was... Oh, he loved it. He loved it. <laughs> And when he got out of the Navy, his requisite four years later, he sent me the Roy hat, the white hat, which I put away as a kind of artifact from that, that kind of play that we did together. Wow. Well, that's interesting. I mean, we, we were just talking about how you hadn't really written anything autobiographical, but this obviously inspired something very personal for it, you. It would be fun to write something about that time in his life. I'd have to get his permission, you know, to write about it. Do you think there's um, anything psychological that has prevented you from writing autobiographically? You think there's something scary about that for you? Or? Possibly. I mean, I'd have to give that a lot more thought. Some of it is that I just get very interested in other people. I think that that is the thing of looking outward a lot as a young writer, is that i am always been very curious about other people's characters and maybe less curious about, you know, myself. I don't, I don't necessarily think of myself as a protagonist. <laughs> <laughs> You're not uh, one of those narcissistic people like the rest of us who sees themselves as the lead in their own movie? No, I feel like I'm just a big receptor. <laughs> just, <laughs> what screenplay most advanced your career, uh, would you say, in terms of you know, the money you could command or the power you had or, or stature or assignments you could get? I think after I wrote um, the first draft of The Curious Case of Benjamin Button that mm. people had a better sense of who I was as a writer. So it, was that one of the scripts that got around that everyone, yes. it somehow everyone had read it? For a long time it was passed around that way. I think just because, uh, not necessarily for its amazing writing so much as just the scope of trying to make a film that covered so much and was about so many, um, you know, profound things, I guess. You know, not that I ever, I don't know that I ever completely mastered that story, but it did get passed around a bit. Yeah, well, something that epic that you could go in so many different directions with, I guess it would be hard to think of one as the right. Yeah, path. exactly. Yeah. Is that something you bump up against in, in other original screenplays? Like, how do you know when something's done? Well, I don't know that we ever do know when things are done. Um, I know it's not original to my father-in-law, um, Aliyah Kazam, but he, he, I remember him saying to me at, at some point in his life, um, a work of art is never finished, only abandoned. And it's not, I, know, I know it's not original to him, someone else said it, but it was the first time I had heard it. And I think that that's true. There's a certain point where you just have to say, I'm going to stop now. Huh. I, I, I think that I've taken this as far as I can take it today. And at a certain point, you just have to go and make it or turn it in or whatever, whatever phase you're in. You know, if you're editing, you have to at a certain point say, this is the movie. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Uh, do you write 
Um, when, when you know it's something that you'd like to direct, do you write the script differently? Do you write in more camera movements? Do you write the action or tone differently? I'm not aware of doing that. I think I just try, I see the movie very clearly when I'm writing. I try to put down what I see and let other people in on the joke and hope that they are seeing the movie that's in my head. And it's important to do that whether you're writing so that another director will take it and interpret your work or whether you're trying to get financing and attract actors to it. They need to know what the movie is. And so I, I try to put as much on the page as I know how. Right. I mean, is there a danger of putting too much? I mean, you read other scripts. Do you read some where you think they're, they're just trying to describe too much? I think that that is um, a problem with beginning writing in particular, is because if you're, if you're writing visually, you're seeing so much, and there's a tendency to want to describe every bit of behavior and everything that's in the room and so forth, because it is vivid to you if you're seeing the movie in your head. But one of the, part of the craft of screenwriting is to write, um, to write in such a pithy way. It's almost like being a combination of a poet and a journalist. You're trying to get the important information out there, but you're trying to do it with enough concision and um, accuracy that you're almost like a poet describing something in as few words as possible, but as vividly as possible. And there's pretty much only one way to interpret it in that way. Right. You don't want there to be a lot of confusion because it is the blueprint for the film. And later you'll have prop people working with set dressers, working with art directors and production designers, and they'll be looking at that little piece of description, and they'll be saying, is it this or is it that? Right. So you do have to help them out a little bit by trying to write you know, precisely. Well, don't you think there's also an element in the, in, when you overwrite that's like a control issue that you're, you, you want to control. Maybe you're not thinking of it consciously, but. Well, possibly. I mean, it's possible for people like that, if they knew they were going to direct it, they could describe less. Um, I don't think there's any screenwriter working um, that's getting their films produced that doesn't try to direct a little bit on the page. Because if you know that this is a sad moment at the end of something, you're going to try and write a transition that allows that sadness to sit there for a moment. And you don't want to just bluntly go to the next scene. You want to describe something. But that's technically direction. If you're saying what the, what the character looks like or emotion that they're making or, that, or even that they're sitting still for a moment, you are providing direction. But if you don't put that there, the scene isn't going to land in quite the same way and allow the reader to have that moment to experience it before you move on to the next scene. Right. So slowly you learn to kind of hide this direction so that it's not intrusive, it doesn't become the point of the scene, and it allows the director room to interpret and say, I know that they wrote them sitting still here, but instead I'm going to go to leaves you know, outside of a window, for instance. Right. You know? and as long as they are giving you something that allows a resting place, it doesn't matter. You know? You're just giving one version of it. Have you ever experienced anything in the industry that you felt related directly to your being a female screenwriter? There's a little bit of pink and blue coding that goes on in the film business in terms of material that you're offered, for sure. Um, every now and then, I will feel in a meeting um, a little bit as though I'm out of place because there's so many men in the room. They don't certainly nothing that they're trying to do. It's not a harassment situation, but I'll just have a sense that they're looking at me like I'm a girl. Huh. And, it, and, I, and I, you know, that doesn't come up from my husband. <laughs> so I, we, we sort of have like a lab thing going on at our house, you know, it's like he has one experience, I have another. There's a certain amount of overlap, and then the ways that they're different, some of them have to be put down to gender. Interesting. And so, you know, I don't let it bother me. I just go on doing my silly stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, and that, that didn't change with the rise of, you know, female studio heads? That didn't really affect it? I mean, you, you said you'd worked with Amy Pascal, and, and I guess you've worked had, with most I've of worked them. with some wonderful female yeah, executives. Um, maybe it has changed. We, without the, the, we don't get to have the parallel experience in which you're working with the male to know what the difference would be, you know? 
So I, I don't know. It's a hard question to answer. Statistically, we know that there aren't as many women working in film as there should be. Right. Um, and obviously, some kind of bias trickles down. Having said that, I've had a wonderful career, and I have many opportunities ahead of me, and I have nothing to complain about. Uh, speaking of wonderful opportunities, tell us quickly about uh, the movie you, you've written that you're directing, The Mermaid Singing. Well, I'll talk about Mermaid Singing, and I'll also talk about The Jane Prize, which is a film that I've been working on this year, which I think could end up going ahead of The Mermaid Singing. Oh, okay. Um, the Mermaid Singing is a project I've tried to get made for four years. It is based on a novel by Lisa Carey, and it is one terrific novel. She wrote it when she was 25, and it takes place in Ireland. And I was very lucky to get a, a strong cast attracted to the project. But it is a movie with a lot of women in it, and it has been hard to get it made for all the reasons that when people make indie films, they tend to think of genre pictures if they are at the budget level that this is. And to shoot it in Ireland, it was always between seven and eight million. And so we have struggled to hit our mark in term, financially. And we okay. have been financed several times, and I have actually been in prep on this movie into week five and had to shut down because we lost cast. Oh, wow. So it's been a very fraught project, but weirdly, weirdly, it has been financed again. And I've been having meetings this week with an Irish line producer, and it would seem as though the pieces have come together for me to make it. Unfortunately, it's happening at exactly the same time that Sony would like me to move forward with my project, The Jane Prize, okay. which is a, an original that I wrote about a family of Jane Austen scholars. And I'm having my first table read of that um, next Tuesday, oh, just great. a few days. And fingers crossed that they you know, like what they hear and will continue to encourage us to cast and move toward an official green light. So. Yeah, well, having those two pro uh, two projects together, that's that's the kind of problem you want to have, right? Absolutely. <laughs> and again, with enormous gratitude, but I have to also thank the producers on The Mermaid Singing who have never said die, you know, at a time when I was ready to step back and say, you know, I'm not sure this will ever happen. My producers were saying, no, we're going to make this happen. Right. So, very lucky there. Yeah. Well, Robin, good luck with all of that. <laughs> really a pleasure talking to you. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for being here. And thank you for being here as well. Don't forget to check out the other great interviews with industry pros in the series. And remember, it all starts with you. The next written by credit could be yours. I'm Jay Fernandez.